and then it's taken off again on this side. And again, that humidifies the oxygen quite effectively. So just the, the fact that the, the oxygen coming in is blowing on the surface of the water means it picks up enough oxygen. There'll be water in there to uh, humidify the supply going to the patient. So the water may be warmed if that is necessary. And I didn't in my demonstration, but I wasn't giving it to a patient. But you should use sterile water for irrigation. Um, to prevent the possibility of any contaminants in the water being inhaled into the patient's lungs. So we've looked at equipment, we've looked at uh, the supply, the flow meter, the tubing, the mask, and the humidification. Let's now go on and think about specific nursing aspects of oxygen therapy. So thinking about nursing aspects, well obviously Appropriate explanation to the patient is vital if they know because the patient needs to know what's going on so we can gain their full cooperation and the patient is uh, relaxed about the procedure. So, as always, we need to take time to communicate in ways the patient can understand, give them appropriate explanation of the procedure, as with any procedure. One of the extra things with oxygen therapy is very often the mouths do get a bit, I know they shouldn't, but they do get a bit dry and sometimes a bit sore. So pay attention to mouth care. And these days we're not tending to use lotions like glycothiamol and things. We just use toothbrush and toothpaste for mouth care. If the mouth's clean and moist, it, it should look after itself. And a major, point, a major part really of nursing care is observation of the patient's condition. How are they responding to the oxygen therapy? For example, are they cyanosed? What's their respiratory rate? How deep is their inspiration? Is it gasping? Is it wheezing? Are the chest movements symmetrical? So all your nursing observations of the patient's respiratory condition are very important, as well as observing the respiratory rate. How distressed are they? How easily are they breathing? This can be aided with uh, spirometry and peak flows. And the mental state of the patient is often a good indicator. Patients that are becoming hypoxic can become confused and will lose consciousness actually fairly quickly. So diminished consciousness may be a sign of uh, acute uh, hypoxia. And other things like level of dyspnea we've mentioned, orthopnea, is, are, they, are, they short, are they short of breath when lying down? So quite a lot of nursing observations to monitor the effectiveness of the oxygen therapy that you are giving. Maybe you're fortunate, and we're about to demonstrate this, you'll have access to pulse oximetry. Now these devices are quite expensive, so you may not have one available, but if you do have, then they're, they're remarkably useful. They can, they, they, this one is a portable uh, model, and it consists of this, this bit here, which we'll see in a minute. And what you do is you put this probe on the patient's uh, finger. You put it through the fingernail and uh, I think we can see there there's a... Um, can you see the red light in there that's... Let's, let's just, we can see it. There's a red light here, there we are. Flashes through the fingernail bed and somehow in a clever way that registers how much uh, oxygen is there we are. That registers how much oxygen is, is going through the patient's uh, finger. Yeah, you can see it there. So, Catherine's our patient today. She's not really a patient, she's a student nurse, but we're going to put it on a finger and we'll see, what, uh, see what's happening. So, make sure it's properly lined up, going through the fingernail like that, and then we'll see what result we get. Well, she's in a stressful situation at the moment, so so pulse rate is about 90. So this is the pulse rate here. This is me. I've intimidated her, I think. But the important thing is here, the oxygen saturation is 98. So we've got 98% oxygen saturation, and we've frightened her a bit, so her pulse has gone up a bit. But it'll settle down now. You see there, it's settling down now. Down to about 94. But normally it's quite fit, so <coughs> normally it'll be about 75 or something. But... um. 
The important thing is we've got 98% oxygen saturation. 99% oxygen saturation. And that's just breathing ordinary, <coughs> ordinary atmospheric air. So that, that indicates that everything is, is, is in quite a healthy state, in Catherine at the moment. There we see a pulse rate settling down now. You often do see this when you put patients on pieces of equipment that uh, it's a bit unfamiliar. Mine's, let's just try I mean, Mine's probably high as well because I've been dashing around picking this thing up from the hospital. Let's see what I've got. Right, so at the moment my pulse is, what's it going to be? Mid 70s, 76 there. And oxygen saturation, again, uh, 98%. So we can see the oxygen saturation, and from that oxygen saturation we can decide that at the moment, Catherine, please say, say neither of us need oxygen therapy, so we can accept that. So, very simple device, quite expensive unfortunately, but excellent for monitoring um, the, the amount of oxygen the patient requires, and, and indeed if someone comes in with a chest infection or something, you know, you can check the oxygen saturations and you get instant information, and that didn't hurt, did it? No, not at all. Completely non-invasive therapy, so very useful device if one is available. Of course, if not, the, way, the, 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 the other way that this is done is sometimes by using them, <coughs> by looking at blood gases, looking at arterial blood gases. And of course, that's very invasive because you've got to go into an artery to get the blood sample. So pulse oximetry, excellent aid to uh, nursing observation if available. So monitoring the amount of oxygen the patient's receiving. Now one thing to remember is that patients that are getting oxygen therapy very often will be unwell anyway, that's fairly obvious. And people with infections <coughs> or other illnesses are more prone to opportunistic infection. So make sure the delivery system is not infected. Now, <coughs> this would mean that the system is either a new system, if it's a disposable type uh, setup you're using, or if not, you'd have to make sure the equipment was properly cleaned and, of course, ideally uh, sterilised. What you must be certain of is that you're not passing a patient from one patient, uh, an infection from one patient to the next. So if equipment's been used on someone with, say, pneumonia, then clearly it must be sterilised before it's used on someone um, <clears throat> who's got a, another condition, or even if they have a, even another patient with pneumonia. No cross-infection between patients. So sterilise the equipment or use new disposable equipment. And patients who, who uh, are on humidified therapy for long periods of time might be at more risk of infection because bacteria can be carried into the lungs in the water particles. And water part so water particles in the air may transport bacteria in humidified oxygen therapy. O2, of course, is oxygen. So any patient who is receiving oxygen therapy should be observed for infection. Uh, there should be nurse sitting up where possible, encouraged to cough to expectorate uh, any uh, sputum that they're producing. Chest physio may be appropriate, and as we've said, new or, or sterilised equipment. Uh, should be used on a new patient. Now we need to think about some physiology now, the physiology of respiratory control. The reason that you breathe is because your diaphragm goes down, your ribs go up and out, that increases the volume of the chest. As the volume is increased, the pressure is decreased. Therefore air is sucked into the lungs to uh, equalise the pressure, that is how you inhale. So respiration is controlled by diaphragm, intercostal muscles and to some extent the accessory muscles of respiration as well. But what is it that controls those muscles? Well it's the nervous system that controls those muscles and uh, ultimately the impulse to breathe arises from the medulla oblongata in the brain stem, from the respiratory centre in fact in the brain stem. And uh, <clears throat> in health, the respiratory centre is stimulated to send these impulses to the respiratory muscles when the amount of carbon dioxide in the blood increases. So the reason we breathe actually is not because we need oxygen, well of course we do, but the reason we breathe is to get blow out, to, to exhale, to excrete carbon dioxide. 
It's the rise in CO2 that stimulates respiratory effort.